The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I've been getting to play with this robot for a few years now, three years of my life basically devoted to that robot. Uh, it was one of the most exciting, uh, technically challenging, exhausting, uh, stressful, uh, but ultimately fulfilling things I've ever done. Um, we got to basically take this robot, make it drive a car, get out of the car, that was tough, uh, open a door, uh, turn valves, pick up drill, cut a hole out of the wall, Notice there's no safety harness. It's battery autonomous. Uh, it has to walk over some rough terrain, uh, climb some stairs at the end. It had to do this in front of an audience uh, with, uh, basically, we got two tries. And if your robot breaks, it breaks, right? Uh, and there was, a, there was a $2 million prize at the end, right? We, uh, we wanted to do it not for the $2 million prize, but for the technical challenge and uh, Myself and a group of students, uh, just like I said, absolutely devoted our lives to this. We spent all of our waking hours on this. We worked incredibly, incredibly hard. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, DARPA, our, our, uh, our national defense funding agency, has gotten excited about the idea of these grand challenges, which get people to work really, really hard. Uh, the self-driving cars were, were the first one. Uh, and MIT had a, a very successful team in the Urban Challenge, led by John. Um, and then. Uh, it's unquestionably had transition impact into the world via Google, Uber, Apple, and John, John will tell you all about it. Um, I think in 2012, DARPA was scratching their head saying people haven't worked hard enough and you know, what's the new challenge going to be? And, uh, and right around that time, uh, there was a disaster that, uh, that maybe uh, helped focus their attention towards disaster response. So in, ultimately, it was October 2012 that, that everything started with this kickoff for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, the official challenge was, um, was cast in the, in the light of disaster response, um, in, in, using the, the scenario of the nuclear disaster uh, as a backdrop. Uh, but I think really their goal uh, was to evaluate and advance the state of the art in mobile manipulation. Okay, so if I'm the funding agency, what I think is that you see hardware coming out of industry that's fantastic. So Boston Dynamics was building these, these walking robots and the like. Uh, this one is the one we've been playing with, Atlas, um, built by Boston Dynamics, which is now Google. Um, <coughs> Alphabet. Alphabet, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then I think from the research labs, we've been seeing really sophisticated algorithms coming out, but on relatively modest hardware. And I think it was time for a, for a mashup, right? So uh, <coughs> they, were, they were very interesting in the way they set up the competition. It wasn't about making it a completely autonomous robot. It was, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a twist. You could have a human operator. But they wanted to encourage autonomy. So what they did is they had a degraded network link between the human and the robot, and some reward for going a little bit faster than the other guy. So the idea would be that if you had to stop and, and work over the degraded network link and control every joint of your robot, uh, then you're going to be slower than the guy whose robot is making the decisions by itself. Um, that didn't play out as much as we expected, but that was the, that was the setup. That set up a spectrum where people could do fully, full teleoperation, meaning joystick control of each of the joints if they wanted to. Uh, you know, and maybe the goal is to have complete autonomy, and you could pick your place on the spectrum, right? So uh, MIT, possibly to a fault, aimed for the full autonomy side. Uh, the idea was, uh, was, let's just get a few clicks of information from the human. Uh, let the human solve the really, really hard problems that he could solve efficiently, object recognition, scene understanding. We don't have to, to do that. A, a few clicks from the human can communicate that. Uh, but let the robot do all the dynamics and control and planning um, side of things. Okay, so those few clicks should seed nearly autonomous algorithms for perception, planning, and control. Okay, so um, technically, I, 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 don't, I don't intend to go into too many details, but I'm, I would love to answer questions if you guys ask, and we can talk as much as we want about it. Um, but, but the theme, the overarching theme to our approach uh, is when we're controlling, perceiving everything, is to formulate everything as an optimization problem. Um, so even sort of the simplest example in robotics is, uh, is the inverse kinematics problem where you're just trying to decide if I want to put my hand in some particular place, I have to figure out if I have a goal in the world coordinates, I have to figure out what the joint coordinates should be to make that happen, okay? 
Um, so we have joint positions in some vector Q, and we just say, I'd like to be as close as possible. I have some comfortable um, position for my robot. Uh, we formulate the problem as an optimization, say, I'd like to be as close to comfortable as possible in some, uh, in some simple cost function. And then I'm going to start putting in constraints, like my hand is in the, the desired configuration. But we have very advanced constraints. So, so especially for the balancing humanoid, we can say, for instance, that the center of mass has to be inside the support polygon. We can say we're about to manipulate something. So I'd like the thing I'm going to manipulate to be in the cone of visibility of my sensors, of my vision sensors. I'd like my hand to approach. It doesn't matter where it approaches along the table, maybe, but it should be my, the palm should be orthogonal to the table and should approach you know, like this. And we, can, we put in a, you know, sort of more and more sophisticated uh, collision avoidance type constraints and everything like this. And the, the optimization framework is, is general and, and, can, and can accept those type of constraints. And then we can solve them extremely efficiently with, with uh, highly optimized algorithms. So for instance, that helped us with what I like to call the big robot little car problem. So uh, we have a very big robot. It's a 400 pound, six foot something uh, machine. And they asked us to drive a very little car. Okay, So to the point where the robot physically does not fit behind the steering wheel. Impossible. It just doesn't fit kinematically. Torso's too big. Steering wheel's right there. No chance. Uh, so you have to drive from the passenger seat. Uh, you have to put your foot over the console. You have to drive like this. And then our only option was to get out of the, the passenger side. Okay? So that was you know, a hard problem kinematically. But we have this rich library of optimizations. We can drag it around. We can explore different um, kinematic configurations of the robot. But we also use the same language of optimization and constraints. Um, and then we put in the dynamics of the robot as another constraint. And we can start doing efficient dynamic motion planning with the same tools. So for instance, if we wanted Atlas to suddenly start jumping off cinder blocks or, or, or running, um, uh, we did a lot of work in that regard to make our optimization algorithms efficient enough to scale to very complex motions that could be planned on the fly at interactive rates. So um, one of the things you might, uh, might be familiar with is, is sort of a Honda Asimo is, is one of the, the famous robots that walks around like this. And uh, it does, it's, it's a beautiful machine. Um, they are extremely good at, at real-time planning, using limiting assumptions of keeping your center of mass at a constant height and things like this. And one of the questions we asked is, could we take some of the insights that have worked so well on those robots and generalize them to, to more general dynamic tasks? And um, one of the big ideas I want to try to communicate quickly is that um, even though our robot is extremely complicated, um, there's sort of a low dimensional problem sitting inside the big high dimensional problem, right? So I, if I start worrying about every joint angle in my hand while I'm thinking about walking, I'm, I'm dead, right? So what actually, when you're thinking about walking, even doing gymnastics or something like this, I think the fundamental representation is the dynamics of your center of mass, your angular momentum, sort of some bulk dynamics of your robot, and the contact forces you're exerting on the world, which are also constrained. And in this sort of six-dimensional, 12-dimensional, uh, uh, if, you, if you have velocities, space um, with, with these relatively limited constraints, you can actually do very efficient planning and then map that in a second pass back to uh, the full, you know, figure out what my pinky's going to do, OK? So <clears throat> um, we do that. Uh, we spend a lot of time doing that. And we can now plan motions for complicated humanoids that were far beyond our ability to do it a few years ago. Uh, this was a major effort for us. Uh, my kids and I were watching uh, American Ninja Warrior at the time, so we, we did all, these, all the Ninja Warrior tasks. Um, so you know, that was, that was, there were some algorithmic ideas that, that were required for that. It was also just a software engineering exercise to build a dynamics engine that, was, that provided analytical gradients, exposed all the sparsity in the problem, and, and wrote custom solvers and things like that to make that work. It's not just about humanoids. We spent you know, a day after we got Asim, uh, Atlas doing those, those things to show that we could make a quadruped run around using the same exact algorithms. It took literally less than a day to, to make all these, all these examples work. Um, there's another level of optimization that's, that's going kicking around in here. So um, the humanoid, in some sense, when it's moving around, is a fairly continuous dynamical system. There's punctuations that when your foot hits the ground or something like this. Um, so you think of that as sort of a smooth optimization problem. There's also a discrete optimization problem sitting in there, too, even for walking. So um, if you think about it, uh, you know, the, the methods I just talked about, we're really talking about, you know, OK, I, I moved like this. I, want to prefer, I would prefer to move something like this. But there's a continuum of solutions I could possibly take. For walking, there's also this problem of just saying, 
you know, am I going to move my right foot first or my left foot first? Am I going to step on cinder block one or cinder block two? Right? There's a, there really is a discrete problem which gives a combinatorial problem if you have to make long-term decisions on that. And one of the things we've tried to do well is, is be very explicit about modeling the discrete aspects and the continuous aspects of the problem individually and, and using the solvers, the right solvers that could think about both of those uh, together. So um, here's an example of how we do interactive footstep planning with the robot. If it's standing in front of some perceived cinder blocks, for instance, the human can quickly label discrete regions just by moving a mouse around. Um, the regions that come out are actually fit by an algorithm. They're deciding, they're, they look small because they're trying to figure out where, if the center of the foot was inside that region, the whole foot would fit on, the re on that, okay? Um, and they're also thinking about balance constraints and other things like that. But now we have discrete regions to possibly step in. We have a combinatorial problem and the smooth problem of moving my center of mass and the like. And we have very good new solvers to do that. And you know, seated inside that are, I just want to sort of communicate that there's all these little technical nuggets of, of we had to find a, a new way to make really fast approximations of big convex regions of free space. So you know, we have optimizations that just figured out the, 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 the problem of finding the biggest polygon that fits inside all those obstacles is NP hard. You, you, we're not going to solve that. Uh, but it turns out finding a pretty good polygon um, it can be done extremely fast now, and, and the particular way we did it scales to very high dimensions and complicated obstacles to the point where we could do it on raw sensor data, uh, and that was, the, that was an enabling technology for us. So our robot now, when it's making plans, um, so the one on the left is just walking towards the goal, okay? The one on the right, we removed a, a cinder block, and normally a robot would kind of get confused and stuck because it's just thinking about this local plan, local plan, local plan. That's, you know, it wouldn't be able to stop and go completely the other direction. But now since we have this higher level combinatorial planning on top, we can, we can make these big long term decision uh, making tasks and at interactive rates. So uh, we, we also, the robot was too big to walk through a door, uh, so we had to walk sideways through a door. And that was sort of a standing challenge for the, the guy who started the, the program putting footsteps down by hand said, Whatever I do in footstep planning, it will, I will never lay down footsteps to walk through a door again. Uh, that, that, that was this challenge. Uh, <clears throat> we did a lot of work on the balancing control for the robot. So it's a force-controlled robot uh, using hydraulic actuators everywhere. Um, I will, again, I won't I'll go into the details, but we, we thought a lot about the dynamics of the robot. How do you cast that as an efficient optimization that we can solve on the fly? Okay, um, at, we, we We're solving an optimization at a kilohertz to balance the robot. Okay, so you put it all together, and as a, as a basic competency, you know, how well does our robot walk around and balance? Here's sort of a, one of the examples at, at a normal speed from the, from the challenge. So the robot just puts its footsteps down ahead. The operator's mostly just watching, giving high-level directions I want to go over here. And the robot's doing its own thing. Now, all the other teams I know about were putting down the footsteps by hand on the, on the obstacles. I don't know if someone else was doing it autonomously. We, you know, we chose to do it autonomously. We were a little bit faster because of it, but I don't know if it was enabling. But very proud of our, of our walking, even though it's still conservative. I mean, this is lousy compared to a human. Yeah. So, uh, so we knew they were going to be cinder blocks. We didn't know the orientation or positions of them. So we had a, a cinder block fitting algorithm that would run on the fly, snap things into place with the cameras. Yeah, yeah, actually laser scanner. And then we walk up the stairs. You know, little things. If you care about walking, you know, the heels are hanging off the back. Uh, you know, there, there, you know, there's there's special algorithms in there, sort of to to balance on partial foot contact and things like that, and that, that made the difference. We could we could go up there um, efficiently, robustly. So I would say, though, you know, for, for conservative walking, we, we, it really works well. We, know, we, could, we could plan these things on the fly. Um, and we also had this user interface that if the footstep planner ever did something stupid, the human could just drag a foot around, add a new constraint to the solver. It would continue to solve uh, with a new constraint and, and adjust its, its solutions. Uh, we could do more dynamic plans. We could have it uh, run and everything like that. We actually never tried this on the robot before the competition because we were terrified of breaking the robot and we didn't have, couldn't accept the downtime. Uh, but now that the competition's over, this is exactly what we're trying. Um, uh, but the, the, you know, the optimizations are slower and didn't always succeed. So, so in the real 
scenario, we were using our, we were putting some more constraints on and doing much more conservative gates. The balance control, I'd say, worked extremely well. You know, so the hardest task was this getting out of the car task. Uh, we worked like crazy. We didn't work on it until the end. I thought I thought DARPA was going to scratch it, honestly. And then, but in the, in the last month, it was it was became clear that we had to do it. And then we spent a lot of effort on it. And uh, you know, we put the car in every possible situation. This was on cinder blocks. It's way high. You know, it has to step down almost beyond its reachability in the leg. You know, this thing was just super solid. You know, so Andres and Lucas were the main designers of this algorithm. You see, it's doing. I, I'd say it's superhuman in this regard, right? I, no one. On a human would not would not do that, of course, you know. But um, standing on one foot while someone's jumping on the car like this, uh, you know, it's 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 really uh, works well. In fact, the hardest part of that for the algorithm was the fact that the it's trying to find out where the ground is and the camera's going like this, right? So um, that was the reason it had this long pause before it went down. Okay, but um, there was one time that it didn't work well. Okay, so. Um, and it's hard for me to watch this, but uh, <laughs> you know, it turns out on the first. You saw that little that kick, okay? This was horrible, okay? Um, I'll tell you exactly what happened, um, but I think it really exposed the limitation of our of the tools, the state of the art. You know, so um, what what happened in that particular situation was the robot was almost autonomous in some ways. Um, and uh, we basically tried to have the human have to do almost nothing. And in the end, the, we got the human's checklist down to about five items, which was probably a mistake because we screwed up on the checklist. So, um, so one of the th five items was to, um, we have one set of programs that are running when the robot's driving the car. And then all the human had to do was turn off the driving controller and turn on the balancing controller. But it was exciting in the first day of the competition and, and, and we've turned on the balancing controller forgot to turn off the driving controller. So the ankle was still trying to drive the car. Uh, even that, the controller was robust enough. So, uh, you know, uh, I really think there's this fundamental thing that if you're, if you're close to your nominal plan, things are, were very robust. But what happened is the ankle was still driving the car. I think we could balance with the ankle doing the wrong thing. Except the ankle did the wrong thing just enough that the tailbone hit the seat of the car. That was no longer something we could handle, right? So, uh, there was no contact sensor in the butt. Uh, that meant the dynamics model was very wrong. The state estimator got very confused. The foot came off the ground, and the state estimator had an assumption that the feet should be on the ground. That's how it knew where it was in the world. Um, and that basically the controller was host, right? And that was sort of the only time we could have done that badly. And the, the, the vibrations and everything. I had emails from people of all walks of life telling me what they thought was wrong with the brain of the robot uh, from shaking like that. Um, but that was, that was a bad thing. Okay, so, um, you know, I think fundamentally if, if we're thinking about plans, and that's what we know how to do at scale for high dimensional systems is single solutions, um, then we're close to the plan, things are good. When we're far from the plan, we're not very good. And a change in the contact situation, even if it's sort of cart in a Cartesian space very close, change in the contact situation is, is a big change to the plan. Uh, there's lots of ways to address it. We're doing all of them now. Um, you know, it's all fundamentally about robustness. But <clears throat> ironically, the car was the only time we could have done that badly, right? So we, every other place, we worked out all these situations where, okay, the robot's walking, and then something bad happens, and and you know, someone, lan you know, lances you or something. You know, we had recovery, and then even if the even it tried to take a step, even if that failed, it would go into a, a gentle mode where it would protect its hands because we were afraid of breaking the hands. It would fall very gently to the ground. All that was good. We turned it off exactly once in the competition. We turned it off when we were in the car because we can't take a step to recover when you're in the car and you're the same size as the car. And we didn't even want to protect our hands because we didn't want to get our hand. We, once we got our hands stuck in the steering wheel. When we were so, uh, so anyways, that was the only time we could have sort of shaken ourselves silly and fallen. Um, you know, and what happened, we, we fell down with our 400 pound robot. We broke the arm, the left arm, or the right arm. Sadly, all of our practices ever were doing all the tasks right-handed. Um, but we got to show off a different form of robustness. So we actually, because we had so much autonomy in the system, we flipped a bit um, and said, let's use the left arm for everything, which is more than just you know, map the joint coordinates over here. It meant, it meant you had to walk up to the door on the other side of the door. You know, and you had, it really backs, the implications back up quite a bit. Uh, and we were able to, after having our arm just completely hosed, um, we were able to, to go through and do all the rest of the tasks except for the drill, which required two hands. We couldn't do that one. We had to pick up the drill and turn it on. 
Uh, so we ended the day in second place with the, uh, you know, with a different display of robustness. Uh, That's still pretty damn good. We were happy, but not as happy as if we had not fallen. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, so I think walking around, balancing, you know, we're pretty good, but there's a limitation. I, I really do think that's a, that's a fundamental, everybody has that limitation to some extent. Um, the manipulation capabilities of the robot were, were pretty limited, um, just because we didn't need to do it for the challenge. You know, we had, the manipulation requirements were, were minimal. You know, you had to open doors. Picking up a drill was the most complicated thing. Um, we actually had a lot of really nice robotic hands to play with, um, but they all broke when you started really running them through these hard tests. So we ended up with these uh, sort of lobster claw kind of grippers because they didn't break and they were robust and they, they worked well, but it limited what we could do in manipulation. Uh, again, the planning worked very well. We could even, we could pick up a board and even plan to make sure that the board now, you know, didn't intersect with other place, boards in the world. And we you know, really good planning capabilities and those worked at interactive rates, the kinematic plans. Um, but the grasping was, was open loop, so there's really no feedback. So there's current sensing just to not overpower, overheat the hands. But basically, you do a lot of thinking to figure out how to get your hand near the board, and then you kind of close your eyes and go like this and hope it lands in the, in the board, and mo in the hand, and most of the time it does. Every once in a while, it, it doesn't. Um, you know, we, we experimented with every touch sensor we could get our hands on. That wasn't meant to be a pun. Um, and we tried cameras and everything, but they were all just too fragile and difficult to use for the, for the competition. We're doing a lot of work now doing optimization for grasping, but I'll, I'll skip over that for time. Um, and so the other piece was, how, so how does the human come into the, um, uh, to the perception side of the story, right? So one of these tasks was moving uh, debris out from in front of a door. Um, this is sort of what it looked like actually in the, tri in, the, in the original version of the competition, the trials. The robot would come up and throw these boards out of the way. And you see the human operators over there with their you know, big console of, dis of displays. Um, this is what the laser in the robot's head sees. We have a, a spinning laser. We also have stereo vision. Uh, but the laser reconstruction of this gives you a mess of points. If you asked a vision algorithm, you know, some of you are vision experts, I'm sure, in the room. Uh, if you asked a vision algorithm to figure out what's going on in that mess of points, it's an extremely hard problem. Um, but we have a human in the loop. So uh, the idea is that one or two clicks from a human can turn that from an intractable problem to a, to a pretty simple problem, right? Just say, there's a two by four here. And then now a local search can do sort of ransack type uh, local optimizations to find a, the, the best fit to a two by four to that local group of points, and that, and that works well. And so the robot didn't have to think about the messy point clouds when it's doing its planning. It could think about the simplified geometry from the CAD models. And all the, all, most of the planning was just on the, the CAD models. So this is what it looks like to drive the robot. So um, the robot, you, you click somewhere saying there's a valve, then the perception algorithm finds a valve. Then the robot starts going, it actually shows you a ghost of what it's about to do. Uh, and then if you're happy with it, and if all things are, are going well, you, you just watch. Uh, but if it looks like it's about to do something stupid, you can come in, stop, interact, change the plans, and, and, and let it do its thing. It's kind of fun to watch the view, robot view of the world, right? So this is sort of you know, what the robot sees. It throws down its footsteps. It's deciding how to walk up to that valve. You know, again, so, so when, when the right arm was broken, this was one of our practice runs, but when the right arm was broken, it had a valve. We had a bit flip, now it had to walk over to the other side of the valve. And you know, there's a lot of things going on, and a lot of pieces had to work well together to make all this work. Um, one of the questions that I'll, I'll, I'll get before you ask it, you, if you've written it down, okay, you know, that's fine. Why were the robots so slow? Why were they standing still? Um, a lot of people out there waiting for the human, maybe. Uh, a lot, but for us, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the planning time. The planning algorithms were super fast. Most of the time, we were waiting for sensor data, and that meant there was two things. There was waiting for the laser to go spin all completely around, and also just being conservative, wanting to get that laser data while the robot was stopped. And then there was getting the laser data back to the computer that had a fa the fast planning algorithms and back. So if there was a network blackout, we had to wait a little bit. And that meant we were standing still. But we've actually done a lot of work in lab um, to, to show that we don't have to stand still. Uh, this is now the robot walking with its laser blindfolded and using only stereo vision, using uh, one of the, the capabilities that came out of John's lab and others uh, to do stereo fusion. So that compared, the laser gives, um, gives very accurate points, uh, but it gives them slowly at a you know, low rate and you have to wait for it to spin around. The, the camera is very dense, very high rate, 
but very noisy. And John and others have, have developed these new algorithms that can do real-time filtering of that noisy data. And we demonstrated that, that was, they were good enough to do walking on. And so we put all the pieces together, real-time pla footstep planning, real-time balancing, real-time perception, and, and we're able to show we can walk continuously. This will be the, the future. So you know, we had to do networking. We optimized network systems. We had to you know, build servers, unit tests, logistics, politics. You know, it was exhausting. But um, I think it was overall incredibly good experience, a huge success. I think the robots can move faster with only small changes, mostly on the perception side. You know, the walking was sufficient. We can definitely do better. The, um, the manipulation was very basic. I think we need to do better there. But we didn't have to for those tasks. Uh, the robustness dominated everything. So um, I'll just end and take questions, but I'll, I'll show this sort of fun, again, robot view of the, this is the robot's, uh, you know, God's eye view of, of, of the world that while it's doing all these tasks, you can sort of see what the robot labels with the geometry and what, it, what it's uh, leaving as points, and it's just kind of fun to have it on in the background, and, and I'll, I'll take any questions, yeah?